Thank you, Mara, and thank you for yeah. Thank you for inviting me to this amazing event. I used to talk on the very scientific conferences, and I'm so happy to talk to like people on the ground who are actually doing the job and and from whom we learn. So I'm really, really very happy to share what um, I can share from academia. I was um, thinking uh, just to talk, and then I thought like, no, actually, some people, because I saw that the many people are from very many different countries, and some actually would like to read because of the language, and that's why I did put some slides. And but it's not very many. I'll um, I'll put them in. I'll give you a very short presentation, and then I will. Uh, uh, I have a lot of time to answer your questions, and uh, I will share my screen with you. Because again, I think some people feel more comfortable in um, um, following the uh, some letters <laughs> because of the language, probably. Um, okay, so I start sharing my screen, and uh, here we are. So I would be talking today about um, connecting to nature and uh, not only about connecting to nature, but also about the lifestyle and health. And this is what I actually um, know best or I have been doing a lot of research about. And uh, this is a little bit about my background. So I do come from the hardcore lab. My PhD is in pharmacology, in gut pharmacology, actually. And uh, I kind of went all the way through the very classic lab research, actually on animals. <laughs> and then I went uh, into the environment and back to nature. And actually, interestingly, recently I went back to lab and actually was studying what was happening in the gut with gut microbiome when children are exposed to nature. And I think you, I will share with you some of the uh, uh, results of my study. This picture is actually two hours ago. I was in the countryside and there were these little piglets jumping on the road and I could not hold myself uh, from hugging one of them. So <laughs> I did. And um, I, I do try to embrace the nature in many different ways. The program that I invented or worked with in Hong Kong was called Plan Grow. And that's why it's written Plan Grow in Hong Kong. I will be talking, uh, mentioning it in a number of um, slides now. So, but actually we would be talking today or the topics of what I would want to discuss with you or share with you. It's some bad news and some good news. And unfortunately the bad news, like we heard in a number of um, uh, talks, uh, even today, uh, it was the traditional approach. And yeah, many traditional things are very good, but some traditional things are actually, we, they, we can improve them and we could probably build on uh, them. And then we'll be talking how, we, what we could do, the new approaches or uh, what is out there. And me as a scientist, I could maybe share with you what I know. I could try to translate it that in a quite a well, language that everybody understands. And then we can, I believe that we all can learn from these practices, both from the traditional ones, what was wrong and what is um, uh, on the table now. Um, so to improve health, because I come again, my PhD is in medicine, how to improve health. And the professionals and experts have known it for decades, as you can see that the UN knew, WHO, we all knew how to do, you have different pyramids, you have different recommendations, government recommendations, how many minutes you have to do, what to eat, what not to eat. Unfortunately, there are a number of uh, studies putting all this together and say, actually, it's very little effect if you follow this traditional approach. So the experts standing on one side, and I was one of them and trying to preach to the entire world and um, it did not somehow work. So in the reality, this is the reality check. If we talk about human health, we have both undernutrition, we have severe obesity and 
recently, since maybe 10, 15 years ago, we have very big problems with the mental health. And that's global. Uh, everywhere, you would probably would agree what is happening with children worldwide. So it's not only physical health that we can see, that we could measure, but also the mental health that is becoming measurable now that was not measurable before. When we talk about environment or environmental health, well, you all would agree that the, our planet is in, in, in disaster, both the pollution and what is happening everywhere. And even the current situation, in, in my knowledge, it is related how we, how we treated this planet and where we are today. Solutions, well, there are solutions. And I've been teaching um, some recent years of something called One Health. And One Health is, I will show you a better picture of this. It's actually, it's both human, animal and environmental health. So it's kind of this triangle that you put all together. You cannot longer look only at the humans and only care about us or only at animals and do something about them or only at the planet, the pollution. It's all interconnected. And we do have to work together to put all of these things together. To, to have to talk about and to work with this uh, One Health uh, concept. And it's very heavy concept now. It's There are courses on it. If you want to dig deeper in it, I really recommend it because somehow, somehow when you look at it, it feels like, well, of course it is that way, but we don't, we don't do it that way. And again, I know that you work with education. I also did. And my population was two to five years of age, and then the adult students at the university. So bear with me, I'm getting to why this is important even for kindergarten children. The new type of education interventions and when should we start? Well, uh, we could call it very fancy early environmental education. And I do use these words because uh, when you talk to the grant providers to the governments, to WHO, to UN, they understand that language and we should be talking to them that language because they, when you talk about connecting to nature, they don't understand. Honestly, when I started to do research after my lab environment and PhD in pharmacology in connectedness to nature, my ex-colleagues, they were saying, are you serious? This is, this is not science. So when you kind of, move it and transfer it to the language that it's serious enough. And early environmental education is very serious. And when you start connecting some results of your study, then people start believe you, believing you. And I think it's very important. And the evidence it is very rapidly emerging actually worldwide. Actually in adults, it has been shown a number of, well, many years ago that both physical and mental health and sleep and everything else becomes better when you go out to nature. In children, especially in preschool children, it's quite a new concept, but even there, the recent uh, results and the recent studies, they, they talk about the, the nature will increase the physical activity or we don't call it physical activity for young children. We actually call it active play because they don't, neither parents understand physical activity for that age. Learning, diet, and even mental, mental health. So that is also improving. And there is quite a, a lot of evidence about that. Well, here you have one of the very interesting paper that I recommend you if you need some evidence. I suggest to go to CORE 2019, and there they actually talk about the very interesting, um, uh, the kind of put together what nature exposure or uh, us connecting being in nature, what it has to do with our learning outcomes. Because very often me, when I lived in Asia until three months ago, I uh, would hear like, yeah, 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 physical activity, all of this is good, diet, but how about, um, uh, learning and how we, we, my child will be smarter, will get better grades. And uh, of course, then the, there are studies actually showing that, yes, it, that is the situation. Uh, somebody, uh, yeah. 
Uh, the question is if this would be available on YouTube, and I think yes, it will be available on YouTube. I just got a question just answering at the same time. So there is uh, evidence out there, and I was the one who was helping with the evidence and still am. When we talk about environment and uh, nature, these uh, good practices, they actually originated in Scandinavia and in Sweden. I'm from Sweden originally. And um, they started with the forest schools. And uh, as you could see in 57, we had um, um, so-called uh, Skogsmulle, uh, which is the, uh, uh, was a um, movement, especially for children. And it's kind of was created that she should go into the woods and um, uh, the trolls, the this uh, special figures in the or creatures in the woods, they would uh, teach you and they would answer some questions. Because actually, the creator of this uh, movement, you could see him there, Josta from. He is uh, his daughters would ask him the questions, and he would say, "Well, I don't know the answers, but you know, let's go and ask uh, the trolls in the woods, and they will give us the answers." And uh, of course, it became very big um, movement, uh, exported movement, and uh, like I write here, Japan is a very, very, very popular. But it's not only Japan; it's actually everywhere in the world, it's, uh, it got picked up and now it's a kind of very natural way to teach children at this age. And um, yeah, it's adopted in many countries now. It's not only in Sweden anymore. Then I would like to ask the, about the um, interventions or when should we do any or introduce any new habits? Uh, again, habits, interventions, it would be the same way we want to change something there. And I like this um, uh, picture because actually this is the talking about the medical risks. And you could see here it's metabolic and related risk. And you could see that the age line and how big they become. And you could see that if you don't do anything the, with the life course, things will become worse and worse. But actually, if you have the intervention, if you do try to change something, the earlier is the better. It stays with you. It stays with children. And you can see that it goes already to pregnancy. And if you introduce these new habits or new ideas or new well interventions, the healthier lifestyle, let's say, uh, if very early, let's say to pregnant mothers or later on to very, very young children, they will have much lower uh, level of this metabolic and related risk later on. Again, you can read all of this in, um, in this paper that I uh, referenced here. Another question, usually when I talk about nature interventions, which actually in your language would be, or in my language as well, interventions are very, it's a very scientific word, but just go out and play in the woods and we'll learn from where we are. But is nature possible really in the big city? I, I got asked many, many times, like, come on, uh, it's easy when I'm right now in New Zealand and uh, yeah, there's nature everywhere. And how about the big cities? How about, let's say Santiago or, any big city. Uh, I can say that I lived in Hong Kong 10 years and I mean, nothing can be more urban than Hong Kong. And actually it is possible. All my studies that I published, they are conducted in Hong Kong in the middle of the city. I'll show you the map in, in a second. It's very possible. And I think that it's very, very important to do it there because the concept or the idea that urban is toxic, it's, uh, it's actually very, we, we have to do something there because now when I'm in New Zealand, to be honest, it's very, uh, it's almost unnecessary to do anything here because children are running their feet here and they don't maybe need that much intervention here that they really need in the big cities. Somebody is asking me links to the sources. Yes, I will do that. Of course, I will do. Yeah, I have all the links. It's very important. And by the way, you can see that I share the links in my also in my presentation at the end. 
So um, what I want also to say that when we do these studies, it's very important if you want to publish any studies, it's very important to do it in the scientific way. And I have another presentation tomorrow. If you want, we will go into details of all these questionnaires and the anthropometric measurements and how to measure the outcomes. Because we all believe that if we go and hug the trees, it, it's good, but it's very fluid somehow. We, we do need to prove it. And it actually is possible to prove if we use the right uh, um, measuring instruments. And of course, we did all of the measuring instruments. I will be sharing this with you tomorrow in details. We created a scale, and I do recommend you to use it because it's very difficult to measure the relation or connectedness to nature in very young children. We're talking from two to five. This is preschool children who cannot express themselves uh, clearly and how to measure them. And actually this is through the parent. You, could, you can actually measure that. It's validated tool, which is very important when you measure anything. If you measure things with the unvalidated things, then actually, it's very difficult to publish or it's less trustworthy in the scientific society. But if it's validated, then yeah, and we validated this tool, go ahead and, and publish it. I, I'm the creator of this, so I, I give you the permission to, to use it. You don't even need to, to ask me about that. Now, the results of our, uh, of our uh, nature exposure, you could see this is the experiential learning. And again, I remind you that it's two to five children from two to five. And uh, this is the, uh, we make avocado, mm, avocado boats from the avocado, but we don't only make avocado boats, we actually dig out the avocado flesh and then we make guacamole and some strange vegetable. And in Hong Kong, avocado is very strange. It's a brown stone that you open and it's green inside. And uh, then you start digging and smashing it. You know, children like smashing things. And then suddenly you can try it because it, you actually created that food. And again, two to five years of age children were doing this with me. And then you just put a little toothpick with a little leaf. You go outside, pick it up, and then you make a little boat. And um, then you go outside and put this little boat in the puddle of water. You get a shower of nature bacteria, which is really very, very good for you. And children, suddenly they forget about things being dirty. They don't care about it. They just care about this little boat and by the avocado boat. And uh, by the way, when they pick up the leaves, they pick up some flowers. You could see the girls are with flowers. So they are totally in a different reality there. So that is the results of the study. Again, the results of the environmental education, you could see that recycling here, very young children. And people say like, oh, they're too young to recycle, but they actually they do understand it. They, they see things lying on the ground on the beach and say, ah, oh, this is no good. And I, I can tell you one little story by uh, two year old, uh, two, two and a half year old uh, child father comes to the session. And um, uh, usually mothers bring them, but then the father shows up It's like, hmm, this is strange. And uh, he says, uh, okay, I'm the father of uh, Jacob and I have a question to you. I said, yeah, yeah, of course. And he asked me, you know, Jacob, every time I'm standing and brushing my teeth, he comes and, and switches off the water and he says, uh, water for fishes. So what is this story with fishes and water? I said, well, <laughs> we teach them, we teach them that who else needs water? You know, you have running water. Who else needs water? And of course, the fishes needs water. So he's kind of <laughs> watching everybody saving water for the fishes. And Jakob was, yeah, two and a half. Uh, he understands it. And these girls, they, don't, they probably don't understand which box, but they understand that it, this should be recycled. It should not be on the ground. And again, these children, you could see these children in Hong Kong who are afraid to touch anything dirty because it's a perception of um, the outdoor environment is dirty, dangerous, toxic. And here you can see after the rain, we all run out and they covered 
in mud, uh, splashing everything. And they look like little piglets themselves. So, um, and parents watch them say, what, what has happened, <laughs> you know, because we only have 10 sessions. I don't want to go into details about this program because I will talk about it tomorrow. Today is very general uh, kind of talk. And, uh, but it's actually only 10 uh, sessions, 10 weeks, and they change dramatically in these 10 weeks. So you can actually do things quite um, uh, scientifically. Again, uh, this is another more result from that. You could see we play with food. We play quite a lot with food. And when children play with food, Charlotte, she has a little sheep made of uh, cauliflower. And of course, when you take a cauliflower, it's a big thing. It's a strange. And then you break it apart. And then you look at it. And of course, you can taste it. We taste everything that we play with. Uh, when it comes to food, of course. And that's why all our games are based on the food that is uh, edible and it's raw food, raw vegetables. We have 10 vegetables and uh, uh, we make different um, things uh, like this one, this little sheep. And this is a little uh, art, of course, they create when they have to go out and collect uh, things around uh, treasure hunting. And then they make things like that. And these are very, very young children. But for me as a scientist, I think it's very important to watch them that when you give them a task, like, okay, let's create a face or something, or you don't even have to tell them what to create. They go and they are hunting. And when they hunt, <laughs> when they're looking for things like, they don't care about microbes, they don't care about dirt, about anything. They are totally in that world of discovery and that's what is good to get this kind of shower of good bacteria because when you go to the metro when you go to the public transportation all of things that you touch that is dirty there you have really to think what you're touching especially now but when you go to nature you don't have to be afraid of that all of that is natural bacteria actually they are very good for you now, uh, another thing that people ask me like, mm, okay, but how hugging the tree would influence your eating habits? That does not make sense because again, my background is gut pharmacology. I studied nutrition, etc., And my idea was to improve the, the eating habits of children. And you can see that we had the idea that the connectedness to nature, and then we have the feeding styles, caregivers, feeding styles and children's eating styles. And actually that is because we're talking about very young children. And when it comes to this age, two to five, it's not only eating, it's you're not only changing the dieting patterns or eating habits, it's actually there is another something that is feeding. That's why you have to separate them into, into parts. So we did this study. And nobody believe in it apart from me. And then, of course, we have a lot of results. You can read all of that in the presentation. I, I uh, at the end I give you the references. But we look at all of them. Of course, we have the control. It's randomized control study, and that's why it is actually evidence based. They all published, but we could see that you have both eating behaviors, many different ones. Then you actually look at the um, uh, vegetable and fruit consumption, because that's what we thought would improve because they were playing with fruit and vegetable. And then, of course, you have so feeding and eating. So what has changed? And actually, we do have very interesting uh, changes there. Not only changes, but actually we see a paradigm shift. Uh, on the uh, one side, you can see the control group. And then you have the intervention when we actually took them outside, played, hugged the trees, played with the vegetables, but actually vegetables, they always connected the real vegetables. We don't take the vegetables from the fridge. If we introduce a vegetable, for example, as a beetroot, I literally go buy beetroot with uh, leaves go and dig it in the ground and we go and search for what we're finding today and then we find these leaves that are purple and i say okay let's pull it out and they don't know what is underground and then we pull out <laughs> this uh, this beetroot and of course they for them was like wow interesting and then we cut it and all this juice that comes from the beetroot 
And then I cut it very small pieces and we try raw without cooking. And in the beginning, of course, it's very strange, very strong color. And I usually play as a, making it as a lipstick. And the girls like, hmm. And then the boys even, you know, we're all having lipstick <laughs> of beetroot. And of course, if you have it around your mouth, then you're actually uh, trying it. Anyway, what I want to say that nature here is out digging and introducing the vegetables. And you could see briefly that actually, if you have the parent in the control group, the feeding styles, as everybody expects, are very strong. They very much influence eating behaviors of children. And that everybody knows and agrees. What we do see in our intervention when we have the nature and we have the vegetables, suddenly caregivers play much lower role. So their feeding style is much less important. The children, you have the directly relation with uh, children and nature and the eating behaviors, which is actually connected to autonomy. And it's interesting because at this age, as you know, between two and five, well, three, then children start to develop this autonomy. They become more independent, they trust, and when they trust the environment, they don't need somebody pushing and, and forcing them things. So they kind of, if they play with the beetroot, they do create that relationship with the beetroot on their own, and that actually strengthens their uh, autonomy, not only when it comes to food. In general, they become more independent, more open-minded, et cetera, et cetera. We published it, read it, and if you have questions, you can, um, you're very welcome to ask me. So um, we go to the psychosocial relationship because we had, uh, as I mentioned to you, we, start, we looked at many, many questionnaires and measured a lot of things. Of course, we see that children were less distressed and they, of course, they had uh, less emotional difficulties and fewer peer difficulties. So they were much better communicating between each other if they were in nature. And we actually did it with a SDQ, Strength and Difficulties Questionnaire. So we could compare, that's also a validated tool, and we could see what was happening with children. Published, you can see again reference here. You could see that there are about four different dimensions in our play, uh, our Connectedness to Nature Questionnaire. And it's enjoyment of nature, empathy for nature, sense of responsibility for nature and awareness of nature. So these four things that we could identify in these young children that uh, then we try to study. It's a kind of very special modeling, very complicated modeling system that you, you have many, many questions. You could see how they fall into, into which groups and et cetera. It's been, uh, very, I think this study took us a number of years actually to complete again. But I would like to say that you can see here that uh, it's all of these factors, both awareness, enjoyment, empathy for nature and responsibility, they influence all of the SDQ uh, outcomes like emotional problems. Then you have um, hyperactivity when children are running around and uh, yeah, hyperactive. You have peer problems and they increase the prosocial behavior. So children learn how things work in this uh, in this nature environment, and they become actually much better peers. And then, somebody is writing. Yeah, I think it's maybe I will address that. I do recommend you, if you do any results, any studies, do publish it. It's so important because only when you publish, you even if you don't publish in very scientific, like very scientific papers, you actually influence and you give ideas and people much and more, they, uh, they believe you. And the people who actually have money, and I will give you, I'll show you in what happened in our situation. And uh, it's super important. Uh, even 
like in this situation, I think this paper was, yeah, this was a protocol. That was the first study we published on play and grow. And I just described what we're gonna do. And even that was uh, very, very popular. And I said, you know, every time you talk to people, they said, what do you mean? I said, well, how about that? Everything is described, all our um, background and what we use and all our tools. It's very easy to communicate with people because again, here I have 30 minutes presentation. And if you do want to go deeper, you're welcome to do that. If you, if you, I can recommend you to read uh, any of these papers. So do publish, it's super important. Plus, it creates the evidence and actually anything like you have any good practice in your school and uh, you see something amazing happening with children, with families, and you say you want to share it. And if you have evidence, people would believe you much more, not only in your little community, do share it because it's such enormous interest out there and people would maybe want to if you like we played with vegetables maybe you play with something else and i think that people really really want to hear your story so i as a scientist i do strongly recommend you to to publish and to, we all have to create this um uh source of evidence and the whole uh yeah to uh, to convince other people who are much less into um, they don't believe in nature, maybe some people. And why does it matter? Well, this is Hong Kong. And I just want to say that the green little thing there, play and grow, that's the, where you, the University of Hong Kong is, that's where we started, where I started my study. And uh, it was just a test. Uh, we had a little group and we were uh, doing that. And then, because we did publish, and uh, then when I published a number of papers, I went to the government and I said, look, we have these outcomes, everything, we changed this, everything was super positive. And we need more money to disseminate it in the community. And actually I did get the money. I, did, I got millions in, in Hong Kong to have it all over. You could see these are the plan grow studies, uh, they're different colors because some were just starting, some were completely just on a test basis, but this all of this started from one little study when you get money when people believe you you can have a team and you can actually do it everywhere and that's why it matters it really matters and again this was um, discussed quite a lot in media i went to chile and to latin america and um Australia, etc., and had a number of collaborations everywhere. So it's just kind of spreading the whole thing. And I don't think because I have this amazing plan grow, which I think is amazing, but because actually it is evidence-based. It's very easy. It's a tool that you can apply for money and you get the money from the grant providers. And then you could make a lot of good things happening in the community. In the conclusions, I could say that, yes, it is complicated because what we think the nature and what I think all of us who are in this uh, wonderful, wonderful conference, I cannot say conference, but gathering, we all believe in this and we, we sense it. We, we don't need to be convinced, but people out there, they are, um, they need more evidence. And that's why we do need to, uh to take it into consideration if we want to spread it and we do need to spread it and actually we have to when we talk to them and we talk to the entire world we should talk about one health it's not only as i mentioned before we talk about our little group or saving the planet everything is planet animals us children everything is a planet and we we do have to work together to do it and we have to do it early in life because then when it starts because then when when if children become good people from the very beginning and i mean good not only for themselves just for everybody for this planet then we all will win so you have to do it very very early it, it's not sometimes when they start school as soon as they are born and I do believe we have to do it globally. We have a team in Hong Kong, you could see, we, we have a number of countries that are involved in this. And uh, uh, this picture on the right side, it's actually 
uh, at the University of Hong Kong when we are hugging the trees with these children on the campus itself. So you don't need to go far away actually to, to be able to perform this, uh, uh, this kind of studies. Because remember, children of this age, they are very, very short, right? For them, one big sunflower is like, a, I don't know, it's a tree. So you don't need to take them to some very fancy places. It's enough to go to, just to find a little bush. Plus they're very short. So they see all the ants and things that are, so, well, I don't need to explain this to you. I think you're much better in how to do it. So I think uh, I just wanted to make a point that it's even possible to do it in a very, very crowded urban environment. And you can check out uh, both the Food Nature Lab and the ABC videos. And ABC videos, I think it's um, maybe you would uh, be interested because um, when in the COVID times, uh, when we could not do our program, unfortunately, uh, the parents were, because we had a queue to be in this, in this program, because it was free, of course, it was a research program, and they said, oh, how can we, can you please put something online, and uh, as I mentioned to you, we had this 10 study, 10 vegetables that we played with, and I, of course, I put all of those vegetables online, and I thought, like, well, 10, why don't I make all of them, like A for avocado, B for beetroot, <laughs> C for cucumber, etc., and we created vegetable ABC. Nobody talks there. All of them are not longer than three minutes uh, long. And uh, we just make different things with vegetables and it's just music and nobody talks. I do recommend you to check them out. And um, yeah, and now I will stop this and take your uh, questions. if you have any. Oh, somebody is asking how to connect with me. I think uh, that my email is published uh, at this website and, uh, but actually it's tanya.sopco.gmail. So it's very easy and everything is published. I'm very happy to share with you anything I can, um, I can share. And uh, you can, again, you can start with the YouTube. They're free, um, those short little videos. And yeah. I think it was the most um, complete talk I've heard all these days, uh, Tanya. Oh, and thank, thank you. you so very much. So very much. Oh, I'm very touched. Thank you so much for this. I hope I can, um, yeah, uh, because I know that there are a lot of people who, uh, who want to uh, learn more a little bit deeper, but maybe they don't dare to ask questions like I did not dare, you know, when I was <laughs> doing in the beginning of my um, things. And uh, it's like, I thought maybe if I put some references, people would be more open to or brave to ask and to, to do that. As somebody, do you know of people organizing work in India? Mm. You know, uh, I don't. Actually, I've been contacted from many countries about the this uh, uh, questionnaire that we created because essentially it's a very short questionnaire. It's only 19 questions. Uh, the one I showed you, it's a scale, how to measure connectedness to nature, right? And it's been translated to a number of languages. So people usually contact me and say, can we do it? And of course I give them the right. I say, yeah, go ahead, just uh, translate and validate it. So I know Turkish, Latin America, I know Australia is using it, Spain, but nobody in India, no. So you are very welcome to use that. And again, everything is published, all the sessions, all the descriptions, what to do, we kind of, we, I, I worked with it um, eight years. So <laughs> been a quite long um, and detailed description. Ah, interesting, somebody. Outdoor work, wow. 
Oh, oh, that's cool. I will also check that. <laughs> Maybe mail you. Um, yeah, sorry. I mean, I am just unmuting my mic and sharing. So I am Kritika, and I work with Garbage Free India, and we we work with older children actually. So I, that's why I wanted to get in touch with you and see how we could do. And since pandemic, we don't we've not done anything outdoor, but we would love to start as soon as things get better. Oh, wonderful. I'm very glad and I would be very happy to help you with if you have any questions or share with you any, because we do have all the materials, we have scripts, like everything. And again, um, and the vegetables, you already have them in YouTube. So you can start with that maybe. So you can um, check them what you like or what you yeah can start with. But great. Yeah. Go ahead in India. Yeah. <laughs> I can reach out to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. thank you we really appreciate it tanya really from the bottom of my heart thank you so much for being here oh, and thank every, you. everyone thank you for, for attending me. so i'll see you tomorrow tanya again yeah thank you thank, thank you. you everybody everyone, yeah. bye bye, bye. <laughs>